Hello, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Michael Granado. I'm a history and philosophy educator, and I was having a conversation what kind of prompted this video. I was having a conversation with a student, a student of mine recently about how to identify a credible source, how to find a good, reliable source online when you're writing a research paper, yes, but also when you're looking for general information about a subject, how to know if the author you're reading, if the website you're reading, is providing good, reliable information. And one of the ways that I was talking with the student about is to determine whether or not the author is an expert in their field or has expertise in their field. And this is an idea that has come under, um, I don't want to say scrutiny, it's become very complicated recently with the rise of social media, with the access of information that people have uh, on the internet, because prior to like the mid nineties, if you wanted to learn about like ancient Roman civilization, you'd go down to your local library, you check out a book and more than likely the person who wrote that book would be like an ancient historian specializing in Rome. So you didn't really have to worry a whole lot about whether that information was reliable or whether or not it was, it was good information. Um, all that has changed over the past 20 years with social media. Yes. With the access of knowledge it's one of those weird ironies of the 21st century that we have more than ever before access to as much knowledge and information as we want. Yet the downside to that is become increasingly difficult for us to navigate what's a good source what's a bad source. And a major player in that navigation, so to speak, is, is this idea of expertise. What makes somebody an expert, how to identify an expert in their field. And as the title of this video suggests, um, what we've seen recently, by recently, I'm, I'm really talking about the internet age. What we've noticed with the rise of the internet and the use of the internet is that there's been a lot of questions, uh, debate, and scrutiny, controversy surrounding this notion of the expert. So that's why I decided to, to make this video on this idea of expertise. So on to the first question, what makes somebody an expert? Now, on a surface level, this might seem intuitively obvious to a lot of people. You're having a conversation with somebody. Let's say you're outside working on your car. A random stranger happens to walk by. I guess this would be less, less common maybe than it used to be, but you're outside working on your car. A random stranger stops, walks by, and they say, Oh, I notice you're working on your car. What seems to be the problem? And you say, well, you know, I, I turn the key. The car sounds like it's trying to turn over, but it doesn't ever start. And they say, oh, well, and I'm, I'm not going to pretend to know anything about car or car mechanics, but they say something that on a surface level seems to you to indicate that they know what they're talking about. One of the most intuitive indicators of expertise is depth of knowledge, the ability of the individual to communicate to you what they believe to be the case about whatever topic that you're talking about. Now, of course, they could be wrong, and there's a lot of false self-confidence that people have, and people love to pretend that they know about things that they actually don't know about things. But this is one of the first immediate ways that we can identify an expert is, is depth of knowledge. And for the sake of this first part, we'll say that it's genuine knowledge, that somebody genuinely knows a lot about a particular topic. Another way that's a little bit more tangible would be experience and training. So let's say, for example, that you have a problem with your air conditioning. Um, you call up a shop and you say, hey, uh, my fan's on, but it's not blowing cold air. This is a problem. I live in the American South. It gets like 100 degrees over the summer. This is a problem that I have at least once a year. So you call them up, but well, let's say before you call them up, you're researching about who you should call. Maybe you don't have a reliable AC guy. So you go and you do your research and you see on their website, it says, 20 years experience HVAC certified. 
So one way to distinguish an expert is the amount of experience they have, how many years they have spent doing that thing that they're going to help you with or give you advice on or usually charge you money for, and training, what sort of official regulated training have they received? And that also ties in with another criteria, which is generally education. And this is usually why we seek out education, especially in certain fields like medicine, engineering, law. Education kind of provides a universal standard, typically in the form of a degree or certification that a person has that lets you know that they've done this kind of universal required course for anybody who's trying to get entry into that field that they've passed the test, that they've done, that they've done the, the, the field work, the research, the clinical hours that they needed to do in order to practice what they are now practicing. Now, as you can imagine, this looks very different depending upon whether we're talking about an HVAC repairman, an electrician, a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer. But regardless of what we're talking about, there's usually a standard, a bar of entry that the person, technical training, years of experience, some sort of official exam that the person has to pass in order to gain entry into that field. Now, just because they've done that test, passed that certification, doesn't necessarily make them an expert per se. We might want to disagree about that, but it does make them an expert compared to the common everyday person who does not have that certification, right? If you had to make the choice between who's going to work on your AC, the person with 10 years of experience and the technical certifications that they have posted and plastered all over their website versus Bob down the street who assures you that they've spent years working on their own air conditioning, you're going to pick the person with a decade of experience and the certifications, at least. I would hope so, unless you know and trust Bob and have a reason to prefer Bob over and against the other guy. Now, that sounds, hopefully, relatively straightforward, but it's not always so clear-cut. And to give you an example, I'm going to use myself as an example. So am I an expert? Am I an expert? Am I an expert? Am I an expert? Now, this is where, well, it feels weird to, to talk about myself, first of all, and it feels weird to identify myself as an expert, um, but I do have some of those qualifications that I was just talking about. So let me cover these because I think it would be helpful to also highlight exactly how in terms of academic expertise, how specific and detailed we're talking about. So as I mentioned at the very beginning of this video, I'm a history and philosophy educator. So the, to begin with, in order to be an educator, you need to have an official education. That's usually one of the bars of entry. So I have a BA in philosophy, which is in the United States, a, a four-year degree. Um, an advanced degree, a master's in historical theology, theological studies, um, a master's in history, and I'm currently completing my PhD in philosophy. Now, one of the things about academic expertise is the further up the ladder you go, the more and more narrow it gets. So based off of what I just told you, you might say, well, are you an expert or you, you are an expert in history, not really. Or you might say, well, you're an expert in philosophy, not really. Because in the same as the case with any academic area of study, law, medicine, psychology, physics, you, you, chemistry, take your pick, right? Because history, philosophy refers to these very broad, huge areas of study. And as I said, the, the further up you go to the master and the doctorate level, the more and more specified you get. And so in my case, what I'm completing my, what I did my graduate work on was very specific areas in the history and philosophy of science. So for my master's in theological studies, I focused on the reception of Newtonian thought specifically in an English theologian named Samuel Clark. Samuel Clark 
famously had this correspondence slash debate with this German philosopher named Leibniz, where they were kind of parsing out what exactly a Newtonian universe meant for the kind of physicality of God, so to speak, or the implications that God exists, what like what it would mean for God to exist in such a universe. It's a really strange, interesting debate. Uh, Leibniz also one of the first to present a substantive challenge to Newton, kind of predicting um, Einstein's uh, concept of relativity. Anyway, different discussion for a different day. I, I, I found all of that really interesting. So yes, I have a background in theological studies, but that doesn't mean that I'm well-versed or familiar with St. Augustine or the notion of the Trinity and the early church or the development of the Council of Nicaea or 20th century Catholicism or any of that. I was highly specialized in one specific area, the same with my history degree. Now, I had to take a lot of general classes, uh, general classes on things like um, American evangelicalism in the 20th century, uh, I took a couple of I took a class on Thomas Aquinas's uh, system of virtue ethics, for example. For my history degree, I took a class on um, the political discussions of surrounding World War II, specifically between uh, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Right, but that doesn't make me an expert on those things. For my history degree, I focused on the reception of Darwinism in 19th century America. And for my philosophy degree, uh, for my PhD, I'm getting a PhD in philosophy. But again, my focus, uh, I have some pictures here. My focus for my philosophy degree is on the 20th century French philosopher, Gaston Bachelard, who wrote a lot about uh, epistemology, the history of science, aesthetics, and the philosophy of time. And within Bachelard's work, I'm even more specialized, focusing, focusing specifically on his philosophy of time. And here's the other thing about expertise. Not only are you getting more and more specific into what you're studying, but other experts in the field typically aren't really going to agree with what you're saying about the topic or, the, the, or how you're establishing yourself for your research is usually by pushing, challenging, or sometimes overthrowing some sort of scholarly idea or even consensus. So for example, for my research, I'm focusing on a kind of obscure argument that was put forward by a Bachelard scholar named whose last name is Kotovich. He wrote a book called Gaston Bachelard, Philosophy of the Surreal. And in the appendix to his book, he makes the argument that Bachelard's philosophy of time was atomistic, that it was based upon Bachelard's reading of the early atomist and how this morphed into 20th century physics, especially 20th century uh, microphysics or quantum mechanics. And so I'm kind of taking up that argument. And according to my advisor, when he wrote that appendix, he was debating whether or not to even put it in the book because he got so much negative feedback by other French philosophers and Bachelard scholars who didn't really like that reading of Bachelard. So I'm, I'm putting forward, I'm pushing that argument even further by focusing on Bachelard's philosophy of time and focusing on the ways in which 20th century physics kind of influenced, formed, and shaped his view rather than focusing on the philosophical influences. So even if I'm reluctant to call myself a Bachelard scholar, but even if I were to take that mantle or claim that title, the interesting thing about it is um, that the other Bachelard scholars in the world, there's probably like 10 of us in total, <laughs> the other Bachelard scholars would actually probably not like what I have to say about Bachelard. That's the weird thing about uh, expertise or uh, advancing further and further into your degree. Now, I have some other pictures up here because there are some auxiliary areas uh, of focus that by focusing on Bachelard, I also have to be somewhat familiar with. Um, two people in particular, the French philosopher Henry Bergson and, of course, the scientist Albert Einstein. 
I have to know a little bit about the history of philosophy and for my case, more importantly, the history of science that's happening in the early 20th century. And then generally speaking, to be familiar with, because I'm writing about Bachelard's philosophy of time, general ideas, concepts, debates within the philosophy of time as a whole, as well as, as I mentioned before, the history of science. So even though I'm getting a PhD in philosophy, even though I've spent all of these years uh, doing research and writing, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in philosophy as a whole, because again, I'm only studying this one specific area, but I am knowledgeable about it. And this largely comes from my teaching experience. I've spent the past decade teaching introductory history and philosophy classes. So I have to be familiar with general concepts in history and philosophy, but like with history as well, to say that I'm familiar with historical concepts when I have to teach like world history one and two, that's a 300,000 year time span that I'm covering from the beginning, the emergence of human beings in Africa, all the way to like uh, September 11th, if I'm talking about US history, it is literally impossible for anyone to be an expert in that entire range of history. But I do have to be somewhat familiar with those topics and ideas. But my expertise lies in a very specific area, if that hopefully that makes sense. I bring all that up to say that even if somebody has a PhD, even if somebody has 15, 20 years experience working in a particular area, you still have to be mindful of the fact that that experience is oftentimes very focused and that education is oftentimes very focused. And we have to be careful that the person that we're listening to is speaking to that specific area when they are speaking as an expert, because if not, this could lead us into fallacious thinking, which brings me to my next point, which is the logical fallacy associated with expertise and appeal to authority. So an appeal to authority occurs when someone claims that a statement is true simply because they or an authority says that it's true without any other supporting evidence. And an appeal to authority operates under the assumption of expertise when that person may not necessarily be an expert. So we have a, a couple of examples of this. Um, one of my, I can't say one of my favorites, one of the ones that I've heard a lot of time. So you could see there the, the wealthy neighbor example. My wealthy neighbor says that this investment is a sure thing, so it must be a good opportunity. The assumption here being that because somebody is wealthy, they must necessarily be good with their money or because somebody's wealthy, they must be an expert on finance or investment. So when they give you advice with that assumption of expertise is that you ought to listen to their advice. Now, what's the problem with that? Where? Why is this fallacious? Why is this a, a logical fallacy? Another example might be you go to your doctor for a checkup. You're talking to your doctor about how you're struggling to lose weight. And your doctor says, well, my recommendation would be to stick with this particular diet. Let's say my recommendation is to stick to the Mediterranean diet. So what's problematic about both of those scenarios? Well, with the example of the wealthy neighbor, you have no idea what sort of background that person has in finance or investment. You're operating on the, under the assumption that because they're wealthy, they must know about these things. But of course, there could be other reasons for their wealth. Most likely, they probably inherited that wealth from their family, from their parents, got that wealth from some additional source and then built off of it with the money that they already had with no indication, with no certification, with no training, with no them working in the finance field for the past 20 years. There's no reason to believe that they know any more, any more about investing or financing than you do. Now, with the doctor example, this is a little bit more tricky, and this gets back to that area of specialization, the issue of specialization that I was talking about earlier. 
your general practitioner that you go to for your general checkup may not be a great source of information about nutrition because a general practitioner, as the name suggests, is, is broadly concerned with health, but may not be up to date about information concerning nutrition as a dietitian or nutritionist would be. So generally speaking, when you go to your doctor, this is why they will give you a recommendation. Typically, they'll say, well, would you like a recommendation to a nutritionist? Or we have a dietitian on staff if you would like to speak to them. Because diet and nutrition is one of those things that is very much so limited to the individual and based off of a lot of conditions that the individual may or may not have. And so it's usually talking about a like a specialized personalized plan, but I'm going to start talking about this because I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but an appeal to authority fallacy would be as if your doctor said, you should do this diet, believe me, I'm a doctor. And this is why the, the example of specialization is so tricky because yes, they are a medical doctor and a medical doctor has expertise in the area of medicine. But going back to what I said before, expertise in terms of academic expertise, the higher up that degree ladder you go, the more specialized you get. And this is how expertise can lead to problematic discussions, ideas, in conversations, assumptions that people make about particular areas, because it's it's not always clear. Even if because it may be a it may be easily identified. We might be able to easily identify when somebody's an expert in an area, but especially if if you yourself don't have a background in your area, it may be almost impossible to say whether or not that person, if they have an expertise, has an expertise in that specific area. And in medicine is probably the easiest example of this and probably one of the best examples of what you should do and how you should treat this. Because like I said before, if you go to your general practitioner and let's say that they're concerned, um, God forbid, that you may have cancer, that general practitioner is not going to attempt to treat you or to diagnose you with cancer. What are they going to do? They're going to recommend you out to a specialist. They're going to recommend you out to an oncologist, and they're going to let that oncologist make that decision and make that prognosis. But this gets a little bit more tricky. Let's say if you're listening to a podcast and they're talking about, you know, pick your controversial topic. Maybe they're talking about something like climate change. I saw this recently. So I was thinking of an example as I was talking, I thought of an example, I put on my headphones so that way we can watch this clip together, um, where this idea of expertise and uh, speaking to one's area of specialty kind of becomes problematic is on these podcasts and YouTube channels when you get somebody who is a perceived expert and they start talking about an area that falls well outside of their specific area of expertise. And I have a quick example here of Jordan Peterson talking about climate change with destiny. What I see happening is two things. We have climate models that purport to explain what's going to happen over a century on the climate side, but we have economic models layered right on top of those that claim that there's going to be various forms of disaster for human beings economically as a consequence of that climate change. And so that's like two towers of Babel stacked on top of one another. And so, because if, if people were just saying, oh, the climate's going to change, there'd be no moral impetus in that. It's the climate's going to change and that's going to be disastrous for the biosphere and for humanity. But that's an economic argument as well as a climate-based argument. So I show that clip not to get into a discussion about climate change and climate change denial, but to illustrate exactly what I'm talking about here, because what is Jordan Peterson an expert in? Now, technically speaking, uh, Dr. Peterson is a clinical psychologist, so he has a background in psychology and he has a background in helping to treat people. I'm not sure what kind of treatment that he used to focus on, but of course he has gotten famous over the past, I'm not sure how long, not because of what he has to say about psychology, but mostly because of what he has to say about every hot button topic and issue, uh, trans rights, freedom of speech, uh, climate change. For some reason, he's weighing in on the climate change debate. But for somebody who just casually clicks this video and starts wa starts watching it, maybe they have a little bit of background context 
with Peterson. They see the Dr. Peterson. They see uh, Peterson speaking on topics as if he's an authority. And they might watch this video and mistakenly assume that Peterson is raising legitimate points or has good questions or problems or concerns when it comes to this topic. But here's where expertise can really help us is one, identifying if the person who is speaking on that subject has a background in that area. Does Dr. Peterson have a background in climate science? No, he does not. Should we, and that's not to say that people who don't have education, years of training or expertise can't raise questions or problems for a specific area. Of course they can. What should start to raise alarms is what's raising alarms with this clip is when the non-expert starts to say things that contradict, that go against the established consensus of the expert. Unless you are an expert in a field, unless you have that background information, unless you have that background basis of knowledge, then the likelihood that you're raising some sort of major objection to what has been established by people who have dedicated their entire lives to a subject is very, very slim. But yet people still choose to to follow these people. People still choose to give these people credibility and weight to what they're saying. And this leads me to, and this is completely speculative on my part, um, what I've noticed kind of with the decline or the, the death of expertise. Because part of what we're seeing here, and I can't quite put my finger on when exactly this happened, is a growing distrust of expertise, a growing distrust of census. I mean, I think a major factor in this, at least within the context of the age of the internet, most recently undoubtedly was COVID-19 and the lockdowns and the shutdowns that happened. There is a growing distrust of experts and a growing distrust of consensus. And within the context of the United States, this goes back quite a ways. There's always been sort of a undercurrent of anti-authoritarianism and anti-intellectualism that has been present in the United States history. Um, one of the examples that comes to mind for me, if you look at the religious history of the United States, the United States has tended to favor religious groups and organizations that have been decentralized. If you look at early the rise and the spread of early Protestantism, um, these are decentralized churches, often almost completely dependent upon a, a single pastor and kind of a cult of personality that was born around that person that had little or no allegiance to any sort of larger organization um, or organizational body, especially if you look at the American South. And there's also kind of always been an undercurrent of anti-intellectualism. So I mentioned that one of the, my areas of background is the reception of Darwinism in 19th century America. You see this more so in the 20th century with the Scopes trials and the various lawsuits um, and public debates that happen around the teaching of creationism and intelligent design in the mid to late 20th century in the United States. But you're seeing this, I think, more urgently in recent history is that the notion of the expert has become increasingly politicized. We start to associate political value or a political designation with a sort of expertise. Uh, climate change is a, is a good example of that. Climate science is deemed to be a overtly political issue. And this might stem from the fact that climate science has uh, very real implications for policy and for policy makers, but the scientists themselves and the content of the science has been deemed to be like liberal, for example. And I bring this up, um, I, I bring this up because it's, it's concerning. Um, expertise, as I mentioned before, should have a pretty hopefully a pretty straightforward criteria, but also to help people, hopefully to help people identify um, what makes somebody an expert and what makes a source 
credible. Um, I'm not sure if that was helpful. Let me know if there's a is if, if there's another way that you have to identify expertise. I'm more than happy. I would love for you to to share that with me in the comment section. And yeah, I guess I've been rambling long enough, so I'll leave it there. And I'll see you all next time. Thank you for watching.